Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I am the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our topic today is the Folio Roadmap Update. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. This is the first time we're using Zoom, so I apologize in advance if we run into any technical issues. Uh, if you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Harry Kaplanian, Senior Director of Product Management and Software Services at EBSCO Information Services, Kurt Nord Nordstrom, Software Engineer at Index Data, and Paula so Sollinger, Associate Dean for Information Resources at Texas A&M University. So I'm going to turn things over to Harry. Hello, everyone, and we will get started. So Folio is based on three primary strategies for innovation. And key, of course, here is that it's open source. Um, the source code is available to everyone and anyone. It is currently today and will always be. Um, it's available via Apache V2. And again, anyone that wants to can have access to it on GitHub. Um, what we believe this provides is really for the first time in the academic library market, uh, an academic library can go in and if they feel they need a new feature or some new functionality, they can go ahead and make those changes if they have the staffing to do so. They're free to hire anyone or any organization to make those changes for them. And even better, they're ultimately free to be able to contribute those improvements or changes back to the community, back to the source code base, so it's available for others as well. Um, in addition, uh, we're using this concept of continuous renewal. Uh, we spent some time looking around what's going out outside the world of libraries. And when we look at Amazon, Netflix, and these others, they're all based on this idea of a microservice architecture. And the way these works, there is a core platform, really a communication layer, and their services are really built up of these microservices. These microservices do one thing and they do them really well. The advantages of microservices plugging into a platform like this is at any time, a service can be updated or changed without impacting any of the other services or applications that are connected to and operating on that platform, which means if we need to do upgrades later, we have an easy way to do it. Um, and ultimately, we'd like to think that longer term, we have a code base that's going to survive the test of time, um, that's going to be open for changes as libraries change, as the community changes. But even more so with that open platform and that microservice architecture, really putting libraries in the position where they can think about where they need to be in the future, put a plan in place, and start to really innovate. We believe once the core and basic folio is out there is when we're actually gonna to start to see the really interesting things come into play because we've got an open platform that everyone and anyone can contribute to. And then in addition, this idea of economies of scale, and this really ideally goes along with open source, where if you choose to adopt Folio as your platform of choice, um, if need be, you can support that on your own, or you can go to an external vendor to provide that support to your organization. If you're not happy with that vendor, you should be able to switch to a different vendor providing the services while you get to keep the platform that you've chosen. When we look slightly deeper 
at Folio in terms of an architecture, it's roughly arranged like this. It's built around this core entity, the gateway that we call Okapi. Um, one could argue these are the APIs, but really it's the open communication platform. It's the switchboard. It's where the microservices plug in. It has multi-tenancy built in from the ground up as all of Folio does, because um, we do expect it to be set up, configured uh, to maintain multiple library, multi-library setups. Um, in addition to that common platform, uh, one of the concerns we had was because this is being built via open source community, we have different people, different libraries, different companies, different organizations contributing to this effort. And when you purchase an automation system today, they all tend to look and feel all the different applications that make up that service. They all tend to look the same because really they were created by a single organization. And one of the things we wanted to ensure was we have that ability as well. So we built the standard toolkit that we call Stripes. The expectation is that any organization that decides to contribute to this project will take advantage of that UI toolkit, thereby giving us that similar look and feel. The other thing that Stripes gives us is really the ability for organizations to really spend more time focus on the business logic, the features and the functionality, and not so much on the UI and other parts of the system as well. Also, the first pieces of Folio to roll out will be some of the more basic pieces. And so roughly the equivalent of cataloging, circulation, resource management or e-resource management, acquisitions, which will actually built in part of resource management, will roll out with the core platform. In addition, we're expecting integrations with institutional repositories, learning management systems, external reporting or data warehousing applications as well. Um, but what is interesting here, again, our goal here is ultimately to get this gateway out, to get this UI toolkit out, to get these basic applications out so we can get libraries in a position where we can really start to see the innovation that they themselves will bring to the platform, really to support the futures in terms of where they believe or where they want to head. So we started Folio with really what amounts to this overall project plan. This was something that was put, we put together last year. Um, it's really a set of goals that we're trying to achieve as we move through this project. And in 2016, our focus was on a copy that core gateway and the Stripes UI toolkit. And then looking into things um, and really building out things like storage, um, kicking off the UI design. And so that means spending a lot of time with the special interest groups, the subject matter experts, understanding workflows and really building that into our overall design or at least our plan for design. The other key piece we wanted to release in 2016 was this idea of an exemplar app, an application that shows uh, developers how you make use of the UI toolkit, how you make use of the gateway and where your business logic lies. And really the goal here was to get us into a position so we can start to support multi-team independent application development, meaning we fully expect and want external organizations to contribute to this effort. And to do that, we needed a certain amount of groundwork in place to support that. And that's what we focused on. Uh, starting the first quarter of 2017, starting to get the very basics of circulation, mainly because circulation is the one app that really touches virtually every piece of data in the system and generates an enormous amount of uh, data that needs to be logged and also needs to generate transactions very quickly, which really in a sense drives a lot of design and decisions across the system. Um, the basics of resource management, basically at this point items, so of course we could circulate something. And then the basics of um, user and rights management as well, because this is also a piece that really impacts every other application across the system, again enabling us to support that multi-team independent application development and of course driving forward with the UI design. Um, the second quarter, uh, which we're trying to finish out here, our goals were to start up acquisitions, 
um, to start to really drive a lot of work in the system operations, management, setup, and configuration of the system. And they get started on knowledge base integration as well. One of the goals we have driving forward for Folio is not to build a system around a single knowledge base, but to build a system that supports multiple knowledge bases, which we believe is a much more reasonable expectation and better represents how libraries actually need to work moving forward in the future. The second half here, of course, um, starting to drive towards some discovery integration, starting to work through what might an app certification process look like, um, how would someone submit an application to uh, some sort of a process, because what we want to end up with is a way where if a library chooses to use a particular application and integrate it with Folio, we believe they need at least some amount of assurances that it's been tested, it should work reasonably, they should expect it to work with the other applications that exist in the system. And ultimately, by the end of the year, trying to reach something of an alpha, and then ideally by the middle of 2018, something of a beta as well, and ideally in 2018 when we can start to see other vendors coming in, um, starting to provide services, um, trying to help with implementation, implementation, migrations, data conversions, and so on. So ultimately, um, by the end of 2018, maybe seeing some early libraries um, really either ready to adopt or maybe even able to adopt as well. Uh, slightly more detail, that previous chart really showed um, us trying to kick off start projects. And so we do have what amounts to a development plan, and this was based on a document that's publicly available that represents version one functionality that we expect in the middle of 2018. And of course, there were all sorts of estimations, um, planning work done, and that resulted in this particular chart. Um, looking at the chart, at the lower portion of the chart, we see the platform, which represents Okapi and Stripes. Um, you know, that's been undergoing development for quite some time. And as we ramp up more teams externally and kick off more projects, we expect more work is there in that area as well. Integration or continuous integration and deployment and automated testing, uh, we're building in from the start. We want to make sure as many unit tests, regression tests are being handled automatically. Um, and that's an ongoing goal and we continue to work in that area. User management, which was really the exemplar app that was initially released, there continues to be work in that area, although that's really starting to wind down at that point. And really, we're starting to wind up in circulation type functionality. And I think you'll see a lot of this a little bit later when Kurt gives his demo. Um, also, again, kicking off acquisitions, um, uh, the, uh, more details, resource management, which really implies integration of knowledge base and being able to manage your print holdings and your e-holdings as well. And then slightly later, starting to kick off metadata management as well. Um, reporting, we have starting later, where the focus now is really making sure we're logging all data and usage generated by the system so we can get to a point where we can actually start to report um, or ideally feed that data into some sort of repository for BI type work and so on. Um, systems operations and management, that's really roughly amounts to setup and configuration of the system. And there's some of the basics of that starting to make its appearance as well. But we expect as we get more and more functionality that will probably start to ramp up quite a bit later. The final one on the list consortia, which it states is in definition phase. Um, there are really various stages of definition. So there are certain pieces of it that we're getting ready to actually start to implement like uh, the detailed location information um, that really relates to uh, uh, an institution, the libraries within the institution, campus, and so on, all the way down to shelving location. And that's work that's just about to get started. And there's a lot of addition, there's actually other work that has gone on that really relates to how users have rights in a system of multiple libraries across a consortia. And a lot of that development work has actually gone on as well. Probably in the next update, I fully expect this row to actually disappear 
because in a sense, we're learning all of that development work is actually happening across all the other teams. And with that, I'm kicking this off to Kurt Nordstrom so he can give you a demo. All right. Um, can you see the screen let go? Um, oh, I need to stop sharing. Sorry. There you go. All right. Now let me just go ahead and. Uh, all right. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and share the screen here. Everybody see that okay? All yes. Right. So what uh, I'm going to do. Oh, sorry. Good. Yes, I think we all see it. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. So um, what I, I want to do is just take you through a brief walkthrough of a running demo of Folio um, as currently as this. And uh, my goal is to give an idea of what the current uh, state of the, the system looks like. And also, hopefully, as you see this, you'll also get an idea of where things are, are headed um, in, in, in the direction of development. So um, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to log in as an administrator for this particular uh, tenant that we have enabled. Um, our tenant is called uh, DQ, which is just kind of a, uh, a name that we chose early on um, um, in the development process and is kind of stuck as our default tenant. And we're just going to log in as the administrative uh, user for this tenant. So this is our basic login screen, and uh, we get this lovely little message or um, welcome to whatever this is. And I suspect that was just um, when when our UI team was first making their initial foray into getting these things laid out, they needed something to put there. So that's what you have. Although I, I kind of like to think about it as being um, because Folio is so flexible and can go in so many different directions, you know, it's kind of looking forward to that, you know, whatever, whatever this might turn into. Um, but up here um, in the upper right-hand corner, we have these three green squares, and these are our running uh, Stripes apps, and those are going to um, give us some functionality when they call the back end. So let's uh, take a look at the users app uh, to begin with here, which is our user management app. So we have um, here on the right side pane, we have a list of users and uh, we can just scroll through it. It does a little infinite scroll feature. Um, whenever we pull it down, you can see a little status meter and it will give us um, more if you just want to keep on scroll scrolling through that. Although that's not um, terribly useful with the specific user we're looking for. We also have these um, um, facets here on the side where we can choose various criteria that we want to filter our user on. For example, if we want our on-campus users, we can do that, all of our off-campus or what have you and the various categories here. We can also see if we want inactive users or active users or both. And then we can also have a, a search bar that will um, do a keyword search on various fields. And I can just uh, just start typing here and it will filter on the fly here for, for whatever user that I happen to be um, trying to focus in on. So I can very quickly find uh, the user of interest here. If I, if I click on one of these users, what it does is it pulls up a pane that will show us a more detailed view of the user um, with the user's um, own um, information. Then you'll see we have a, the user's fines. Uh, if the user has any loans, we can see their loans. And then um, we can also see the user's permissions. Um, here we don't see any permissions uh, listed because this is just a standard uh, patron who really wouldn't have the ability to do anything on the system. If I went back um, to the result list here and take a look at the administrator user, um, we can see that the list of um, permissions is quite a bit uh, more detailed here because of the things that the administrator is allowed to do. Um, so that can all be managed right in that user screen. And I'm going to come back to the permissions in a little bit to just uh, kind of go over a little bit how that how those work. Um, but just kind of wanted to show you uh, the gist of, of the user the user um, management screen. Um, if we wanted to add a user, what we can do we have this uh, new user button here, and um, we have a basic uh, form field here. And what I can do is uh, just go ahead and fill in uh, just a quick example uh, user here that we would um, uh, expect to see. So uh, let's see. 
We have a few required fields here. And uh, let's see, so, you know, in the patron group here, so it's on campus patron. And we'll go ahead and create that user. And then uh, when we uh, refresh our user screen, let's see if we can find our user here. So there's our newly created user. Um, as you can see, um, the user has no permissions at this time, so uh, nothing really interesting that the user can do. Um, but they're, they're, that's just the, the uh, create user experience. Uh, we can also we have some other um, apps here. We have our items app, which is where we keep track of our holdings. Uh, again, the basic layout is very similar to users, uh, but, but you see we have the various um, lists of holdings in our catalog here. We can filter based on the material type. Um, and then if we wanted to add an item, uh, we can do it in a very uh, similar fashion. Uh, we give that a material type, uh, barcode, uh, location. We don't really need that right now. Uh, the status, and uh, then we can go ahead and just create our item. And uh, should be able to locate our item there, and there it is. Um, so that, that's our item management there. And we also have um, this um, app called Scan. And what Scan does is that is meant to be let's see here. So I was holding on to my uh, holdings result here. I'm just going to see if this is going to go. So I'll go and look at the scan app here. So the scan app is, is this is um, the prototype for what would be um, a front desk application for checking out books. And it, it looks very simple, um, but what, it, what it's designed to do is it will interface with a uh, barcode scanner. So you can quickly look up the user's ID to find your patron. And then we need our barcode um, of the book. Let's see, I think it was one, two, three, four, five, six, I think. And there's our barcode. And uh, let's say done. And now let's go back to our users and uh, take a look at our user that we defined. And we can see that uh, it's currently borrowing um, the book now. So that could. Um, you know, that will be streamlined in the future, but eventually, um, you know, we'll be uh, able to just uh, quickly check out items to patrons uh, with the handheld scanner. Uh, so that, that should hopefully be uh, very useful uh, in the near future. Um, so then what we can do is since we've created this user, we can actually go ahead and uh, log in as this user. So I can go ahead and log out as the administrator. And I will go ahead and log in as my newly created user. And I get the same screen as before with the, uh, you know, welcome to whatever this is. But you'll notice that there's actually no apps being shown here. And the reason for that is because I have defined no permissions for this user. And um, since the user cannot use the apps without the appropriate permissions, the front end knows better than to show you the apps at all because it, there's, no, there's no point in trying and showing you the apps if they're not going to work because you don't have the permissions. So, um, because the user doesn't have the permissions, the front end makes the decision on, on what to show them or not. Um, so this is kind of uninteresting. So we'll log out and let's log back in as the administrator right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the user management. And we'll take a look at our uh, uh, user here. Let's go ahead and find him. There he is. And, um, what we want to do is see if we can give them some permissions. So we have this uh, permissions um, window down here. We're going to go to add permission. And you can see we have a list of permissions that are defined here. These are actually um, 
these are higher level permissions that are, are a uh, collection of lower level permissions that are kind of abstracted away from the user experience. But um, these should uh, be tied enough to the functionality that they give us a sense of what's going on. So here we have the circulation module. We can give them the uh, inventory permissions, and then we have some user permissions here. So we'll go ahead and add the circulation permissions and the inventory permissions. And we're going to allow them to create a user and to um, view profiles here. And um, what we're going to do then is we're going to see if that will enable our um, apps for these permissions. Uh, one thing to show you real quick, though, is we have this other thing here that says faculty, which is not an, uh, that, that is an actually a permission set. And uh, we can go ahead and take a look here up in the settings. Um, where we can actually look at our permission sets. And we can see that the faculty permission set actually contains uh, permissions to um, have circulation module permissions and also user editing profile permissions. So um, the administrator is free to define whatever um, permission sets um, seem appropriate for the system. And that gives you the ability to, to combine permissions into, into roles. So it will be very flexible and very customizable um, based upon you know, whatever the needs are for a particular organization. Uh, so no one should really feel locked into some default uh, permission set that doesn't really uh, suit them. So now that we've given some permissions to uh, Algernon, uh, we'll log back in, uh, mess him again, and see what we have here. Not to clear off my little password reminder. No, thank you. And um, you see, we have the apps now available because I've enabled the permissions for them. And we can go ahead and look in the items app and, and see our items there and, and, and such like. So um, that just kind of gives you an idea of how the uh, permissions uh, work there. So um, one more thing I want to show you before um, I conclude this, this little demo here, which is something that's um, not so much a feature of the um, of the UI that users would typically see every day. It's more of a um, uh, a developer innovation. But what this it does is here in this little about link here, we can get a glimpse kind of under the hood of what uh, is going on for this particular instance of Folio that's running. Um, so we have um, our user interface, which um, shows us the um, the Stripes modules that are being loaded. Stripes is the name of the, the front end um, uh, for Folio. Uh, we see the individual modules that have been loaded. Uh, we have you know, the users um, module and the items and the scan. And then we have some settings modules that are stored in this little settings here. And then we have some plugins as well, uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on there. Um, then we, here we have you know, copy services. Um, as um, Harry mentioned before, a copy is the name of the, the API gateway. So you can see what version of the gateway is running. And then these modules here are all the backend modules here that are required to provide the services that we've, that we've been through. So the auth token is what's needed for login, circulation, configuration, all that kind of thing. So there's really quite a few gears and moving parts here. And these are the whole microservices that, that all provide one thing, and then uh, they get all tied together into a, a seamless system. Um, we have interfaces that are exposed by the services, which is how we um, we maintain consistency across different implementations. Uh, and then here we have various dependencies um, with what's being used, where, and what, um, which you know is, is a little bit technical. But I did just kind of want to show you this because it's it's to me it's very fascinating to see how everything uh, comes together and all the, and just kind of the complexity that, that exists, but is also abstracted away uh, by the front end. So um, it's very neat to, to be in this uh, time period where we have all these individual components that are finally starting to work together in harmony. So I really enjoy seeing that and, and hopefully that's useful to you as well. So that's about all I want to go over with the demo here. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out and then I'm going to uh, pass the presenter ball back. All right, Paula, are you ready to go? There we go. Yes, I believe I am. Um, so it looks like my screen is sharing now. So I'm Paula Sollinger. I'm, I'm Texas A&M's um, representative to the Folio Product Council. 
And that's made up of representatives from EBSCO index data and also all of the um, Olay institutions, the consortium of libraries that's um, uh, partnering with EBSCO and index data to develop Folio. And um, there are a lot of ways to keep up with what's going on. And I'm going to quickly go through the main communication channels. Um, this isn't all of them by any means, but it's the ones that are most commonly used. So let me get started. Um, as um, Harry mentioned at the beginning, um, everything about Folio is open and that includes the development steps as well. And you can follow along and um, make, uh, make suggestions, uh, participate in the discussions at any level you want. I'm gonna start off with kind of the highest level of really just kind of monitoring what's going on with Folio. So um, the best way to do that, if you just kind of want a general update now and then, um, the, go to folio.org. The opening page has a join the community link and that takes you to a page with several options. Look for the box that says stay informed and hit subscribe. And when you do that, that gets you on a mailing list for the Folio newsletter, which comes out twice a month. That gives updates on where uh, Folio is going to be. Um, party invitations now and then. That was an excellent event at ALA. Um, whenever a new uh, special interest group uh, join starts up, a call for members will be presented. Um, there's, uh, there was a call for development applications. And again, um, where Folio is going to be present at uh, major library events. So um, another way of keeping up with what's going on with Folio a little bit deeper than the newsletter is the weekly digest. And you can get that by going to openlibraryenvironment.org. There's a Get Involved link. And on that Get Involved page, look for Join an Olay mailing list and uh, fill out your name and email. And from the drop down box, choose the Olay list and hit subscribe. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But while we're on this page, I want to show you that all of the Olay and uh, Folio um, mailing lists are listed here. Uh, there are, I think, two or three that are members only, but most of them are open to anyone. You can click on the archive and um, see what conversations have been going on. Now, back to the digest, Holly Misselbauer, our project manager, sends this out generally every Friday morning. And it's a sort of a high level recap of what's been going on um, in the Olay and Folio world. Um, here's a plug for today's forum. And um, there's always an update. The main part of the uh, digest is uh, updates from the Olay development team and also uh, brief minutes from the uh, Product Council and also each of the SIGs, most of which meet weekly. And she also puts in, again, a link to the upcoming Folio forums. And I'm not showing it here, but she also lists the previous two or three forums and links to the recordings in case you missed those. Uh, now, to go a little bit deeper of keeping up with what's going on with Folio, um, a lot of the SIG work is recorded here in the wiki, wiki.folio.org, and this is the main landing page you'll see. Uh, I want to point out this Folio Communication Spaces link. I mentioned that I'm giving a brief high-level view, detailed information about uh, all the Folio communication options, including two or three I'm not going to go into here can be found there. Uh, we also keep um, the roadmap is here. Um, the um, V1 document that Harry mentioned, we'll be posting a link to that shortly. I'm not quite sure how we missed that before. Um, uh, but a main, the main value of the wiki is it also links out to the, um, the product council and the special interest groups. And let me show you an example of one of those. This is the main page for the metadata management group. So each page uh, looks like this. Uh, it tells what the SIG is about, what it focuses on, when its meetings are, 
and who the members are. And I want to draw your attention to the space on the left. There's a link to the minute, mid, meeting minutes for each SIG. And here's an example of one from a couple months ago from metadata management. And as you can see, it's much more detailed than the short recap that goes into the weekly digest. And each SIG has one of these. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, the wiki and I showed you how it looks um, just as someone who's not logged in. Um, back at the top of the space bar, the opening bar, it only had one link that said spaces, which can uh, drive you to each of the SIGs. Uh, if you want to participate a little bit more, become a member of the wiki, uh, you do that by starting at issues.folio.org, and I'll come back to that a little bit later also. But if you sign up for an account on issues, click that link and you'll get the sign up box. Once you're a member of issues, that same username and password will work on the wiki. And then when you're signed in, you, you have a few more options. You can see the, all the people who are involved in Folio. There's a brief profile of everyone who's on the wiki. Uh, you have editing uh, rights and you can create pages for the wiki. But what I mainly want to show you is the watch space. Each page has this watch button, and if you click on it and uh, say you want to watch something, you get an email update anytime something is updated. For example, on the SIG pages, when they um, add members or they add the minutes, you can get an update. So if you don't want to go to the wiki a lot and find out what's new, you can watch the things that are most interest to you and that information we push, pushed out to you. Uh, another communication option, which uh, Eric mentioned at the beginning, is discuss.folio.org, and uh, that's a separate login, but once you're signed up, um, you have full rights. Um, the uh, categories will show you a complete list of everything here. Each of the SIGs has its own space, and there's also a few more options than there are on the wiki, such as software, uh, community, and again, like the wiki, there's a link to show you how to set up the pages you like um, to uh, be sent an email version. So if you don't want to come and actively look, again, that information can be pushed out to you. And we really encourage participation on Discuss. Um, some of the questions I saw um, on the chat link earlier would be um, great items for discussion here. Uh, let me show you just a quick example. Um, the user management group has recently been uh, talking about patron bulk import loads. So here's just an example of uh, part of a conversation about how it will work and um, the details of getting that up and running portfolio. And um, there's some really interesting discussions also going on uh, in metadata management about the codex and also the um, user experience one is always pretty active. Going back to the issues.folio.org, it's very similar to the discuss pages, except that it's really more focused to the developers. Uh, so if you're not in the techie details, you can skip that. But if you are, there's a lot of information here. And again, once you signed up, um, you don't have to have any official affiliation with Folio. You're free to ask questions. Um, here's an example of some work that's going on with um, user experience. Of course, um, the more voices we have in Folio, the stronger it will be. So we really do encourage active participation. And the best way to do that is to join a SIG. Again, from that wiki.folio.org landing page, there's a link to each of the SIGs. And when you click on it, um, besides the other information I showed you earlier, there is a link to the SIG convener. All you have to do is ask that person to be added and you will be uh, a member of the SIG. Uh, most of them meet uh, weekly. And again, we really do invite involvement. Uh, as you can see, you can be involved at many levels from just pay, sort of paying attention to really deep, active, having an influence on how Folio will be developed. And we look forward to meeting, you, meeting more of you uh, on these pages. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I think uh, we can go ahead and move into some questions. 
Uh, we've re received a few through chat. Uh, I'll run, uh, they've been answered, but I'll go ahead and uh, go through those since for the benefit of those who don't have chat open. If you would submit a question, uh, would like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A functionality within Zoom. It's, it should be a little icon located at the bottom of the screen. So let's start. Um, so first question, June 2017, this is in reference to the project plan. June 2017 is almost finished. How is your project plan going? Are you on target? So this is Harry. Um, so far, so good. Um, on that overall original plan, our goal was to get those pieces started. And we have some of them, of course, have advanced quite a bit more than others. Some of them are in full on development. Um, some of them are still in the finalization stages, ideally of requirements. Um, but even in those cases, there are some underlying underpinnings that are being built. And so again, so far it's, it's looking pretty good. How much time do you feel implementation will take for a library? And will different size libraries have different time frames? I'll go ahead and try and answer that. And uh, Mike, Paula, any of you, please jump in. <laughs> uh, so I think it really depends on the library in terms of what features they're looking for, the size of the library, the complications in terms of how they're set up and organized. Um, so it's really going to be on a library by library basis. Um, Ideally, our goal to get that beta out there as quickly as possible is so libraries can actually start to play, you know, start to load uh, a lot of, for instance, user patron data, load their entire collection into the system, start to experiment and, and really gain an understanding of what's there. Is there enough for them? Is there, can they run their library? Are there any defects or problems that maybe they can for, uh, um, uh, post that need to be fixed as well. But ultimately, we think that's really the first step to planning. So there was a question about whether this is being recorded, and, and yes, it is. It, it will be posted to the Open Library Environment website uh, shortly. Uh, let's see. We did receive a question. Uh, what is the use case for collecting date of birth info? So currently uh, within the system, we're, we're just playing with sample data for the most part at this point. Um, we, I no longer remember <laughs> what the actual use case was, um, but Part of um, fleshing out some of the early requirements, it was one of the fields that came up. Um, a library has the choice to use it or not and actually eliminate it if need be. Right. Um, Harry, if I can break in here, this was a discussion on uh, the users of management group a few weeks ago. And there are fields like um, date of birth, um, title, um, sir, ma'am, and um, um, gender. and um, a lot of places don't use those anymore. Some do. So I think the thought was just leave them in there for those few places that want them, but um, realizing that most libraries would not use them or just get rid of them completely. And then there is a comment about uh, that it seems like there's inconsistent vocabulary between user and patron. So when we were doing some of the early design work, um, one of the goals for Folio is to support large organizations of libraries, um, whether they be multiple libraries on campus or maybe multiple libraries across a consortia. And what we believe is there can be users within the system that have rights and privileges, for instance, to run circulation or to edit a particular sets of data that not everyone else can. However, that person may also have rights to other libraries within a system. And so in essence, an individual can be a patron 
but can also be a user with rights within the system as well. And it really depends upon the libraries within the system. So users or patrons belong to multiple organizations, have rights across those organizations, but those rights are implied or rather set up by each of the individual libraries. So what a person can do in one doesn't necessarily mean you can do the same thing in another. Can a barcode be used to find a patron? Yes, it can. Um, actually, right now in the setup, some of which um, Kurt uh, presented just a little while ago, there's actually an option there where you can select the field that you want to use as an identifier, and barcode is absolutely one of them. And it can be switched on the fly, and the system will start operating that way. And I think you've already answered this, but somebody asked if the data that's in records is just placeholder text and in the demo. Uh, in the one case for the fine, um, yes, uh, the team is um, really just starting uh, building out fines functionality within the system. And so um, that is just some demo data. The rest of it, though, was all actual code working live in operation. How is the development of work being, how is it development being considered from an accessibility standpoint? So Stripes the UI, um, one of the advantages it provides, not only just providing um, a common user interface that all applications should use to give consistent look and feel, but it also enables us, and it actually already has, to build in accessibility. So any organization that goes in to create a Folio application using Stripes gets the accessibility that's already all built in. Um, there's actually um, internationalization, localization built into the user interface as well. So that comes along for the ride just as well. And I'm, I'm seeing a comment addressing the use case for uh, having the date of birth. And uh, somebody commented that if you're a public library, you may want to restrict types of materials by user age. Mm. So uh, will you be working with Koha and Biowater Solutions? Uh, we certainly have discussions with them. They're an open source organization and well Koha's open source um, by water is a vendor and uh, we strongly encourage them to get involved and I know they've been looking at folio as a project and the code base as well and so um, we hope to see more from them soon will there be advanced search options such as surname borrow ID and so on Yes. Um, there are also um, options uh, that are being built now for um, proxy support as well. So if someone on faculty has someone else um, coming in to the library on their behalf, um, that work is also moving forward as well. Okay, I think we've Hit all the questions. Does anybody else have questions? Please uh, submit them through the Q&A. I do have one that I received internally uh, in regards to assigning permissions. Uh, because notice, noticing that you use the drop down box when doing that. So if you're adding granular permissions and let's say somebody has there's 10 different permissions that a particular staff member needs, do you have to go on that drop down box 10 different times? So, Kurt, do you want to answer this, or shall I? Um, I mean, I can, I can give my view on it. And if if, I, if there's anything that you want to uh, sure. add, feel free. I mean, so um, what I'd say is that you know because we have the ability to to combine permissions into roles. Um, ideally, when you're assigning permissions, you would only have to create that role once and then for most of your use cases probably just assign a single role or, 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 or a couple roles to a given uh, user as opposed to having to wade through all those permissions. Um, but 
I, I guess also, I mean, from a UI perspective, um, was maybe the question if you could like select multiple um, permissions in a single click or, or something? I, I, yeah. think, I think so. I think, you know, would, would it be better to have check boxes and so you just have to do it all at once? Right. So, I mean, I can't speak for the UI team, but I'm absolutely certain that if that's something that many people wanted, there wouldn't be any trouble adding that. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. All right. I just received one. Um, where are the de where where are we with the development with importing data and how will this work? So uh, currently, there actually already exists the ability to import um, data into the system. Um, we're in the process of getting our hands on large quantities of data to import into the system. Um, in addition, um, there's a, a small development team working on the user interface elements so anyone can go in and import data um, as quickly and easily as possible. And that will be available shortly. Any other questions? It sounds like that's a wrap. Yeah. So this concludes today's Folio Forum on the Folio Roadmap Update. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at Olay dash list.openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum will be on July 26 with the topic, How to Invent with Folio. You can go to the same website for more details and the link to register. Thank you to our speakers, Harry, Kurt, and Paula, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Thank you very much. Nice job, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kurt. Yep. Great demo. Went well on our first on Zoom. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm capping that. All Thank right. You. Bye, everyone.